Good evening, everybody. If you could just turn, please, in your Bibles. The two short passages. The first is in Revelation, chapter 21, and the verse 3. But just before I start to read, and you're looking up these portions of Scripture, uh, thank you very much for having me here tonight. It is a real joy and a real privilege. I believe I testified here possibly about 11 years ago uh, as a replacement for my wife because she was sick at the time after having either Jonah or Grace. And uh, I have testified before, but I see a lot of young faces and a lot of new faces from the last time. And uh, so thank you for your warm welcome. And uh, Funny, I have noted here as well a few things. Maybe a student brother embarrassing your minister. But... Uh, I do want to publicly and personally thank, first of all, the Lord for saving me, but for also sending good Christian people my way at the right time. And one of those was who's my best friend, Thomas Martin, and sent him along at the right time. And we've built up a real friendship and a real bond together, uh, but like little and large maybe. But... <laughs> Well, we've both got the same haircut as well. But uh, thank you for your friendship and for the wonderful times of fellowship we've had together over the past 20 years now and for your guidance and especially the guidance you give me in wisdom in relation to one of the very first things that Mr. Martin said, and I'm sure he says it in the congregation here, whenever I get saved, he says, Simon, you, you ask the Lord for discernment and for wisdom and for guidance throughout every day of your life, because these are very important things to ask for. And you know, that has all stuck by me, and I've tried to do that as best as I can. So, he's never missed an opportunity as well when we're out to present the gospel. He's always on fire for the Lord, and uh, we'll have a, plenty of adventures together, many funny, funny stories, and after he has embarrassed Catherine, <laughs> I'm very tempted to embarrass him, but I'll not. Uh, I'll maybe tell you this later if you come and speak to me. So, just thank you again, and thank you for all your encouragements throughout the years. And both of these passages that I just want to quickly read are, uh, are probably those that best relate to what you're going to hear in my testimony later on tonight. So, we'll start and we'll carefully read the first one. Revelation, chapter 21, and the verse 3. And he heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away. And if we just turn quickly to Luke's Gospel, the chapter 18 and the verse 9. And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me a sinner. And I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. We just trust that the Lord will bless the reading of his word to our hearts, and if we just bow our heads in prayer. Lord God and Heavenly Father, Lord, we give thanks for this meeting tonight. Lord, we give thanks for every single person 
who send under the sound of your word tonight. Lord, we give thanks for those already saved on the road to heaven, Lord. Lord, redeemed by thy precious blood. And Lord, we also give thanks, Lord, for those that are in who are yet not saved. Lord, we pray tonight that you'll speak to their hearts. Oh, Lord, break open the door of that heart. Lord, speak to them. Challenge them, Lord. Lord, let them see themselves as God sees them. And Lord, remind them that they're sinners, that they have to give an account someday before you, Lord. Lord, I just pray for help now. Lord, give me the right words to say. Lord, wash me and cleanse me afresh, I pray. Fill me with the Holy Spirit of God. In Jesus' lovely and precious name I ask. Amen. If you've come and you're expecting to hear details of some really wild lifestyle or some criminal past or some perhaps drug-dealing madman, you're going to be disappointed tonight. My life wasn't just as wild as that, and I don't intend to spend very much time even telling you about the things that I did in the past. I was born in the village of Moira, well-renowned for sausages and flowers, and that's really about it. But uh, born in Moira village, and my mum and dad got saved when I was very young. Mum first at a mission, and then my father. We were at Sunday school. I, we heard the gospel from a young age. At about 10 years of age, I sadly made what was probably a false profession at the time, like a seed on the thorny ground, choked by the world's attractions. Didn't last too long. I went to secondary school, fell into bad company, stirred the smoke, had a real, a real following of heavy metal music with groups like Black Sabbath and then songs with names like Highway to Hell and Hell ain't a bad place to be. And I read my Bible now and it reminds me that hell is a terrible place to be. In my teenage years, I joined the local band, played the big drum. I started to drink and then just rebel more and more against my parents. Uh, my dad, he was trying to do the right thing and he was throwing out anything that I shouldn't have had in the house, out of the house. I was getting punished for some of my bad behaviour. You know, I wasn't completely off the rails. However, I was certainly breaking my mum and dad's hearts. I had Christian parents who were concerned for the soul of their son. And I see plenty of young people here tonight. And I just want to ask you, are you deceiving your mum and dad? Are you breaking your mum and dad's hearts? You know, who are you running about with? Who are your friends? Who are you socialising with? Are you saved? Do you really love the Lord? Even worse, I was rebelling more and more against God. I despised going to church. I got to the stage that I, I hated the sight of the preacher. I hated the meetings. I hated the sound of the preaching. I really hated everything about going to a church meeting. I used to sit really uneasy in my seat, listening to the, the fact that I had to be saved. You know, does this sound familiar? If you're here and you're unsaved and you're feeling uncomfortable, thank the Lord for it. He's trying to speak to your heart. He's trying to challenge you tonight. And then turned 19 and... I got all my hair cut off, and as I already mentioned, look at this head here now, you'd go, there wasn't much hair in that, but I used to have long hair, and I got it cut off, and I joined the RUC. My father had been an inspector in the RUC, and for me, I was a wee boy, all I ever wanted to do was be a policeman. I remember my very first day in Garneville, uh, someone came in from the Christian Police Association, and uh, I don't even think they're allowed to come in now and speak to new recruits certainly not in their first week or so. And we were all presented with a little New Testament Bible. And I remember him telling the story about there was a soldier or a police officer somewhere along the border and that had a wee Bible in their breast pocket and that they'd been shot at and the round had got embedded in the wee Bible and saved their life. But the more important thing was that if you were to read and take on board the contents of God's word, that you need to be saved, that it would save your eternal life. And uh, I remember him telling that story. And I remember that wee Bible. I had this kit bag that went to and from work. And I used to carry this Bible about everywhere. Never read it. Wasn't interested in reading it. 
but it was like almost like a superstition. So it was, and it was just a religious thing, and religion will not save anyone. My first police station was Coal Island in County Tyrone, which at that time the troubles were still on. It was a very dangerous place to be. And I remember many times sitting in the back of the police car when the threat was very high and they were saying that there, whatever was going to happen there, they knew there was explosives somewhere or that there was a gun team out, whatever the case was. And uh, they used to send us out in patrol. And I remember sitting in the back of the car many a time praying and saying, God, please don't let me die tonight. Please don't let me get killed. You know, there was a real fear of death, and yet you maybe think, oh, well, you were saying prayers. Surely you, you were a Christian. There's people across this world that we live in pray all the time and pray to all different things and people, and they're not saved. I believe there's a God. Most people do. But the Bible tells us that the devil believes that there's a God. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. I didn't trust Christ as my saviour. I had no real time for him at all. To believe in is to really trust in, to trust in the Lord Jesus. After a couple of years, I was transferred to what was then known as the, the DMSU, or the Riot Squad. Now it's the TSG, Tactical Support Group. And uh, I suppose I had so many fish suppers that outgrown the car and they said, we need a Landover for you. And uh, I went there and that's where at that time they sent all the big lumps of fellas anyway. And uh, my behavior sadly deteriorated and uh, language was terrible. Uh, drinking and gambling were becoming an issue and really wasteful living. We wouldn't have come home for days and days and end. They used to say I was just like a, the barrack rat and stayed in the barracks all the time. You know, the Lord gives his view on drink in his word. In Proverbs 20, verse 1, says, Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is raging. Whoever is deceived thereby is not wise. And I wasn't half wise. And I don't believe that a pure and holy, spotless saviour, who I love today, would endorse this today's modern, high-potent alcohol and everything that comes around with it and all the sinful exploits which usually go hand in hand with it. I don't believe for one minute that God blesses that. In the police, sadly, you witness some of the vilest crimes, some of the worst behavior amongst men and women, young people, from thefts and burglaries, right down to terrible things like child abuse, to murders. I spent years and years dealing with and attending the scenes of many of these types of crimes, of different atrocities. I've seen some terrible things, but sadly this had me becoming more and more self-righteous at this stage in my life, where I was thinking, I'm not so bad. I don't do as other people do. And in quiet times thinking, if, if there is really is hell, why would I be going there? Because I haven't done the terrible things that other people have. But God's word tells us that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every single person in this world has sinned. Each one of us have broken God's law. Sin's in my heart and it's in your heart. I'd almost convinced myself that it was good enough for heaven, that my own goodness would be enough. But it says in Ecclesiastes 7 and 20, for there is not a just man upon the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. God tells us that all our righteousness are as filthy rags. That's all the good things that we can do are just filthy, dirty rags. You see, I stood guilty before a holy and a pure God. I had no love for his dear son. I had no love for the Bible. I constantly searched for faults and failures in Christians, constantly picking holes in other Christians. And you know, if you look, you don't need to look too hard and you will find faults and failings in Christians. That's exactly why they're saved, because they have realized that they had their faults and their feelings and their sins, and they have brought them before the Lord. There's no one perfect but Christ. I was only making an excuse for myself, looking for a good reason not to get saved, but finding faults in those who are saved. Perhaps that sounds familiar to some. We're very good, you know, at comparing ourselves to others, but not to Christ. There were times when I did, would have done some good deed, some good thing, 
and believed that I'd gotten some sort of favor with God, thinking this will get me into heaven. There's only one way to go to heaven, and the Lord Jesus says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. So now I want to tell you about my brother, Gary. I have two brothers, Peter and Gary. Gary is 10 years younger. He was born with cystic fibrosis, which affected the chest, lungs, digestive system. Uh, he was operated on when he was just over a day old in uh, the hospital. He, was, he spent a lot of his younger days in hospital with cystic fibrosis. He never complained or questioned anything at all. He was a real joy to be around. The, what the Bible would describe as the salt of earth type of character. Guy was saved at 17 as a result of two very bold young girls who just told him simply, you can be as good as you want, Guy, but you're going to hell if you're not saved. Then sadly, in April 2004, that's 20 years ago, when Guy was 21, he developed a lump on his leg called a sarcoma tumor, a cancerous tumor. He was admitted to hospital. He had 10 hours of surgery. He had a further five weeks, six weeks of radiotherapy. Then sadly, at the start of July, things would take a turn for the worst. He was readmitted to the city hospital in Belfast. On Saturday the 10th of July, I remember being out fishing and I got a text message and said, will you pray for me? Something bad is happening. I raced down to the city hospital. Mum and dad were there. A specialist or consultant had been in speaking to them. Gary had got more scans done. And uh, they basically said, the results of scans are back. Gary said we could all stay in the room and uh, we could all hear what the results were. And he was told that he had three weeks to live. You can imagine the scene. You can imagine the tears, the sadness. Mum and Dad went out to speak to the consultant. And uh, I was there in my home with Gary in the room. And I said, um, what, are you not so terrified? Are you not terrified of what's happening? And he looked me straight in the face and he said, what's there to be afraid of? I'm going to heaven. And he's more concerned about me and asked me to promise that I would start to go to church. Here is this wee frail 21-year-old telling this big lump of a brother of his that he wasn't afraid to die. And I'm telling you, over the years, I have met some very brave people. I have worked with some very brave people, but I had never, ever seen a bravery like this straight in the face of death. I do now know that that strength is provided by the Holy Spirit to Christians. We read in Ephesians 3, verse 16, that he would grant to you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man. The Lord provides strength for his children. There is no trial in this life too great for God. So it came to Monday, the 12th of July, a 12th of July that I'll never forget. Gary had been attending the Free Presbyterian Church in Nisburn, and Mr. Martin had, had called to arrange his funeral. Now that must have been extremely difficult for both of them. This was the very first time that I had met my brother. And uh, I remember standing in the tar block, and Mr. Martin and I were chatting. And I looked down at the bands. You could see from down on the Lisburn Road, and like a start of a parade. I remember looking down at the bands and, and, and chatting, and there was people at the front carrying placards. And I was angry that my brother was in hospital. And I said, what, what's the complaint now? Or what are people protesting about now? And he said to me, no, no, he says, that's, uh, that's placards that Christians would carry, you know, with verses of scripture. The lead, uh, there's a march of witness at the front of the parade. And I, I never heard another thing. Now, Mr. Martin was talking away in my ear, and I never heard another thing after that, because all I could think was, these Christians are at the front, they're leading, and Christians know where they're going to whenever they die, like my brother. You know, he knows where he's going to. Simon, do you know where you're going to? And then, in the middle of this, he turned around, and again, Mr. Martin interrupted me, and he looked, and he goes, look, he says, they pulled out all the stops this year. And I looked out, and there across the sky flew this wee small plane, pulling a big banner behind it, saying, Jesus is Lord. I was that ignorant in my sin that the Lord had to spell it out for me across the sky in Belfast and remind me that Jesus is indeed Lord. 
So we had to try and get enough fluids to get Gary home for what we believe were going to be his last few weeks. Uh, went into the lift, there was a lady on the lift, and I remember clearly her, her standing and this wee child with her and saying, typical your granny just had to race on ahead of everybody else to go to heaven. She had to get there first. And I remember going and driving down some of the back roads and had to call at a, at a chemist that was open, an emergency chemist, uh, for to bring things to my mum and dad's house. And uh, all the verses of scripture were jumping out everywhere at me. All those years of not noticing, everything was jumping out at me. And there was a wee bit of me wanted to turn around and say, God, would you leave me alone? Leave me alone. I'm so glad I didn't. The Lord was speaking to me. Dear friend, is the Lord speaking to you? At mum's house that night, there was devotionals, Bibles everywhere. Thomas's wee book was there. I remember starting to read through that. It was the first time in over 15 years that I'd opened a Bible or any religious book of any type. I read Gary had a wee daily bread devotional and I'm one of these people, maybe you're the same. When things happen, you start to fast forward and I started to flick through the days ahead to see what message it would be. And I went forward only five days till the Friday the 16th of July. And I have a wee copy of it here that I kept. And it says, a new location. A bank in New York had some flowers sent to a competitor who had recently moved into a new building. There was a mix up at the flower shop and the card sent with the arrangement read with our deepest sympathy. The florist who was greatly embarrassed apologized, but he was even more embarrassed when he realized that the card intended for the bank was attached to a floral arrangement sent to a funeral home in honor of a deceased person. The card read, congratulations on your new location. A sentiment like this is appropriate for Christians because they move to a wonderful new location when they die. They go to be with Christ and the sorrows and heartaches of this earthly existence are gone forever. You know, I believed then in my heart at that time that God was telling me that my brother was going to go to heaven on the Friday the 16th, that the doctors were wrong. He wasn't going to last for three weeks. Remember that night, mum and dad called all their Christian friends round to the house. They all went into the bedroom where Gary was. I remember the closeness of the bond between Gary and my mum. And she got in, she held him in her arm, you know, just like a wee child on the bed. And they all had a time of prayer. And me and my other brother, Peter, were told to go into the room along with them. And I remember just looking at this sight in front of me and then turning around and sincerely, as an unsaved person, turning around and sincerely saying, God, if you're real, all I ask is that you will take my brother to heaven whenever he's in my mummy's arms because of what it would mean to her. So as you can imagine, I kept this to myself. Friday the 16th came. Everybody was busy around the house. The phone had went, there was someone at the door. It was just me and my mom and Gary up in the bedroom. And at about four o'clock in the afternoon, Gary had been sleeping and he awakened and he had a wee groan and my mom got up onto the bed beside him and she held him the exact same way as she had held him on that Monday, five days before. And Gary's heart stopped like that. And Gary went to be with the Lord. Gary's in heaven, there's no more cystic fibrosis, there's no more cancer, there's no pain, his tears are wiped away, he's absent from the body and present with the Lord. You see there's no sting in death for the Christian. One thing we can all be sure of is death, unless the Lord of course returns. By one man, Adam, sin has entered into the world. Death by sin, death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. It's appointed unto men wants to die, but after this, the judgment. There's going to be a judgment day. There's going to be a separating of the lost and found, the sheep and the goats, the saved and the unsaved. Two days later, I attended the funeral in Lisburn, Free Presbyterian. I heard the gospel faithfully preached. I had a whole squad of fellas and girls out of my work were sitting up in the gallery. And you know, I wasn't saved, and I remember sitting thinking as I heard the gospel being preached, I hope this lot up behind me are all listening to what this minister's saying. They all need to get saved. I still wasn't saved myself. That night, they left this big bottle of drink at the door of my house. 
they thought they were being well-meaning. Remember looking at it, saying this isn't the type of spirit that I need. The next day, I had a lot of awkward questions to ask my dad. All, a lot of those questions I believe that the devil puts before you as well, all the doubts. And my dad answered them to the best of his ability that the Lord provided him with. That night, I knelt down and sincerely apologized to the Lord for my sins. That I was sorry. And I believe and I trust with all my heart that the Lord Jesus Christ was God's son. That he died on the cross at Calvary. And he died because he loves me. That he's risen and he's in heaven today. The Lord spoke to me using many ways, many situations to get my attention. I want to tell you if you're here and you're unsaved, the Lord will move heaven and earth to get your attention. Perhaps he's moving heaven and earth as I speak. I don't know any of your circumstances. I was so desperate at this stage to be saved. I prayed a similar thing the next morning. Now I know I didn't have to. You see, the devil's a liar. He tries to remove your assurance. First John said that he have, that has the son hath life. He's the father of lies, the devil. You know, I knew for years that I needed to be saved. And I was frightened of what my friends and my workmates would think. I was worried about what other people would think. Perhaps this is you. Knowing you need to be saved, but afraid to make that commitment, that decision to trust Christ, because you're worried about what other people would think. The book of Revelation 21 tells us that the fearful and the unbelieving, amongst a whole list of others, will have their part in the lake which burn up with fire and brimstone. The fearful go to hell. Dear friend, your friends will offer you no comfort whatsoever in that awful place called hell. It takes a much braver man, woman, young person, child to turn around and say, I belong to Christ. I realize being a Christian isn't just about stopping smoking and drinking. These things you shouldn't do. God removes the desire for that. But it's more than that. It's not just your habits, your heart that changes. You're born again of a new spirit. New spiritual heart. You become a new creature in Christ. Trusting the Lord, enjoying and leaning in his word. Trusting in all his promises. You have a new relationship in prayer. A knowledge that you're never alone. And just as I draw near to a close here, I learned as well that the Christian will still sin. They still have their feelings. There are sadly occasions when the old Simon rears his ugly head. You only need to be in the Dunlop car sometimes before we get to the back row of church. And I'm sure this is familiar to a lot of people with young families in particular. And the arguments and the fights and the bickering happen to start all the time on the way to church. There's an old nature just below the surface. I fail the Lord, but the Lord has never ever failed me. Christians aren't sinless, but they certainly should sin a lot less. You become conscious of your sins, which at one time never would have caused you a thought. God's Holy Spirit dwells within my heart. He guides me, instructs and corrects me day by day. The Lord has blessed me with a wonderful family. Good Christian friends, a Bible-believing church, health and strength, countless, countless blessings. I've had the great privilege of seeing, I say, all my three children saved. I had my inspector in work. I've seen him saved. He's now moved on. My sergeant got saved, which was a real blessing as well. The both bosses saved. They were able to leave me alone. And uh, I had also a colleague who was re restored and is now married and has a, a wee baby to a lovely Christian girl. I could tell you wonderful stories and many stories here if I had more time about how the Lord has been pleased to use and bless me and some of the weirdest and strangest opportunities have came along. The Christian life's not guaranteed to, be, guaranteed to be easy. Storms do come, trials come, the devil attacks. You know, Peter tells it to think it not strange concerning the fairy trial, which is to try you. Child of God, you're not... You're not to be surprised in life when bad things at times happen. I often think of the disciples battered about in the Sea of Galilee. They're fearful. The Lord Jesus is in the hindermost part of the ship. He's right there in the middle with them. Another time when the storm's brewing up and they're terrified again as they're in the sea. The Lord's on the mountaintop praying for them. I have a personal favorite in the Bible, Luke 22 and 31. 
But the Lord says, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you and sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for thee. I have prayed for thee. The Lord Jesus is praying for me. You know, you can put your name right in there and he's praying for you too. He loves you, cares for you. He knows all about you. If you're saved, the Lord is praying for you. There's nothing at all impossible with the Lord. God's word tells us that if we deceive, that we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. Are you deceiving yourself tonight? Do you think that you're going to be in God's heaven without trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ? Without acknowledging your sin to him? Do you think that having perhaps a Christian family, Christian friends, perhaps even going regularly to this church or another church, is going to gain you merit with God? Young person, do you think because your mother or your father are saved, that that's going to gain you favor with God? That you're going to get saved? There's no guarantee of it. We read in Luke 18, the Lord tells of the Pharisee and the publican, who both go to the temple to pray. The Pharisee had all the religion, all the works. Was glad that he wasn't, as he thought, as bad a man as the other man. He boasted to God that he was so good. And then you had that poor tax collector, that he wouldn't even lift his eyes toward heaven. He smote his breast and he said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. The Lord Jesus tells us that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. The Lord saved that man. God wants broken sinners, not boastful sinners. Will you humble yourself, realize that you're a sinner and come to Christ? Or maybe you fall into the category that you know full well that you're a sinner, that there is a God in heaven that you have to give an account to, but you're thinking, I'll wait. I'll wait and get saved when I'm sick or when I'm older. Let me tell you, God is not mocked. If that's your attitude, you might never get saved. You're fooling nobody but yourself. The Lord Jesus Christ willfully gave himself over to his enemies. I can't imagine what that must have been like because I can only imagine if I, in my job, was to give myself over to my enemies, which I would never do, what they would do to me. And I just imagine now the hatred of the devil and every demon what they were against the Lord Jesus when the Lord Jesus willfully handed himself over. He was falsely accused. He was beaten. He was stripped. His beard plucked from his face. He was whipped. He was mocked. He was made to carry a cross up Calvary Hill because he loved you and because he loved me. Does it mean anything to you tonight? That whilst you were yet sinners, Christ died for you. He stands waiting with outstretched arms. The Lord Jesus wants you to come to him tonight. I've told you about my sick brother. I've told you of my conversion. Of God's way of salvation. If I was to tell you or ask you tonight that you were terminally ill, could you say to me, what's there to be afraid of? I'm going to heaven. You know, we're all terminally ill. We all have a cancer. And it's called sin. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the only cure. Behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Tomorrow, even later tonight, might be too late. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, Simon's mother, Audrey, she compiled a beautiful volume in booklet form and published it. It's set across the province, the nation, across the world. And it really was a beautiful tribute to her son, Gary. And that book is called If Tomorrow Never Comes, A Mother's Story. Quite a number of the young people in Lisburn Free Church had a part in that publication as did Audrey. I think Simon, maybe, did you have a 
part in it as well, and a few others just paying tribute to a young man who from 17 showed evidence of the grace of God in his life. It's hard to believe it was 20 years ago. I can remember it as if it was yesterday. 12th of July, City Hospital. I remember being there and Audrey came out and she said these words to me. I'll never forget it. She says, Thomas, you need to go in and talk to Gary. You need to go in and talk to Gary. And she took all her family out and she says, Thomas, quietly, she took me to the side. She says, Thomas, would you do me a favor? Would you ask him, please? I, I, I beg you, would you ask him? Is he afraid to die? I sat beside his bed. He was skin and bone. He had a beautiful smile. It lit up a room. Beautiful, beautiful smile. And I looked at him and my heart was broken. And I said, Gary, I need to ask you a question. Are you afraid to die? And friends, he, he pushed his elbows, skin and bone, into that pillow. It was like just like a marshmallow. And he pushed himself up out of the bed and it was sore. And he sat upright. And the smile got bigger. And he says, no, I'm not afraid to die. It's well with my soul. And friends, for the next half hour, I'm sure the family wondered what's going on in there. I sat in a very special moment with a 21-year-old young fella. And we talked about what it would be like to enter into heaven. And it was an amazing experience. And just shortly after that, four days, we passed into glory. Our burden was for the living. And as a congregation, we were praying for his family and especially for his big brother, Simon. And we're glad that God answered prayer. And Simon has come to know Christ as his saviour. And tonight he has given the challenge, and I'm not going to preach here, I'm just going to emphasise. I wonder how will you die? How will you meet the last enemy? Young person, don't think that you're invincible. You don't know when death will come. None of us do. We're never sure of tonight, never mind tomorrow. And the question must go forth. Where do you stand with God? If you were told, and I don't want to be morbid, if you were told tonight you have only three weeks to live, and then someone said, you know, you may not let last the three weeks. How would you face that dilemma? Especially as a young person. In the full prime of your life. How would you face that? Alone? Surrounded by family? Yes, but alone. Because it's a dark valley death. Now, the atheist lives like this. I want to live so whenever I meet death, death will tremble at me. <laughs> That's not going to be the case. Everyone who is born into this world, even some believers still tremble at death. They fear what really lies beyond. And there is an afterlife, heaven, if you're saved. Hell, if you die in your sin. Now, where will you spend eternity? Will you not come like Gary Dunlop? Will you not come like Simon Dunlop? And trust the Savior. And prepare for death. Be ready for the Lord's return. Whichever comes first. And make sure you're saved. That it's well with your soul. If you need spiritual help tonight. We can't save you. But I mean this. You look at us too. We don't need our supper. But we'll be only too glad. To take time tonight. Open up the word of God. And show you from the Bible. How you can be saved. But you don't need us even between you and the Lord now. Just acknowledge, as Simon rightly said, and as well put, just acknowledge that you're a sinner, that you cannot save yourself. Your church, your good works, nothing can save you. Only Christ, his finished work and precious blood, can save your precious soul.
and come as a sinner, repent, believe, and then receive. Ask Christ into your heart to forgive your sin, to save your soul. And friend, he'll do that. Whosoever shall call shall be saved. Him that cometh to me, I'll in no wise cast out. If he doesn't cast you out, he'll take you in and he'll save you tonight. We're not here to make you a free Presbyterian. We wouldn't cross the street for that. We're here to point you to Christ, the only saviour. Now don't go away without the Lord tonight. Make sure. And if you have any doubts tonight, where you stand with God, if you doubt whether you're saved or not tonight, or if you're afraid to die and think, I don't have the assurance that that man has, and some of you people have. Well, listen, don't you leave this house tonight without getting that matter sorted. You don't want to meet the last enemy death, do you? With uncertainty, lack of assurance, hope it's okay. You can be dead on sure, if you excuse the pun, you can be absolutely certain that you can meet death without fear, knowing if Christ the life. May God bless the testimony and also the messages in song from my brother David. And thank you to all who have helped with the music tonight and for all who have come. Your supper has been prepared. We've given the ladies a little opportunity to get out. No, we haven't. Sorry, we're just going now. All right. Well, we'll just go over and anticipate a lovely supper that may just be a few minutes late, but hopefully everything's ready and in order. Let's just bow briefly in prayer. Friends, could I tell you that there's plenty of room at the table for you, and uh, we're just sit anywhere. There are no seats kept, nothing reserved as such, and uh, we want you to join with us for some fellowship after the meeting. Father in heaven, it is with thanksgiving and praise and joy that we enter into thy courts and stand before thee. We thank thee for the Saviour. We rejoice he is a great Saviour for great sinners. He's a wonderful Saviour to me. We thank thee for the one who suffered, bled and died on Calvary's cross. We praise thee for the one who has conquered death for us, having tasted death for us himself. And now death is but a shadow. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that's all it is for the believer. Lord, it's not an enemy anymore. It's a defeated foe. It's a friend that escorts the soul into the immediate presence of the Lord. And therefore, we do not fear death. Lord, death has lost its sting. And we rejoice that Christ is our victory. And we pray for those who as yet have to meet the last enemy. And they don't want to meet death without the Savior. They don't want to cross Jordan alone. And we pray for them. We pray that you'll save precious souls tonight. Lord, we're not interesting in filling pews. We want to see heaven populated. We want to see sinners repent, be born of the Spirit and washed in the blood, come in faith to Christ alone for salvation. Hear our prayer tonight and come on a rescue mission to this house, to this town, to this province, to our nation and across the earth and save precious never dying souls ere they die in their sin. And where Jesus is, they'll never be. So hear our cry. Hear our earnest plea. Take of our thanks now for uh, today, Lord, and all the meetings. Receive of our thanks for the good things that have been provided. And as many sit at the table to eat and drink, may we do so with a thankful and a grateful heart. And then part us all in thy fear and favour. Watch over the activities of the house this incoming week. Bless the, me the meetings over in Londonderry. We pray for Bally McRennan as well and many other gospel campaigns that are ongoing. We pray, Lord, you'll call out a people for thyself. Save the lost. Restore the backslidden, and revive the church. And Father, glorify thy dear Son and the people of God said, Amen. Amen.